What's up guys, back on site. Today's video, we're gonna be making a ton of mitered beams for this job. Used to absolutely terrify me, but I've gotten really good at a couple different techniques for making these. I'm gonna show you that in this video as well as what not to do whenever you're making mitered beams. I wanna give you guys a little bit of context first. This is the great room where we're gonna be making these truss beams. I've got my workstation set up over here where I'm gonna be showing you guys what we're doing. But I wanna give you a little bit of a sneak peek. Actually, you can see up here, there's some other beams I've already put in. This is the master bedroom, kind of just a basic design, but we've also got some of these beams up here as well. This is the size that we're gonna be making today. So when I started trimming homes, uh, I was just learning and the builders almost always spec a production style beam. Um, and this would be what a production style beam would look like. You'd have sides coming down. You'd have like a one by material in the center. Uh, and then your sides here, you'd have a cleat up on the ceiling that you would nail the beam sides into. Maybe a couple cleats up in here that you would also nail this bottom piece into. Different ways to assemble those. But the reason these were so common and have been for decades is because they don't require much in the way of tools to build these things. You can basically put these things up um, with very, very limited tools. But as we go on, clients are a little bit more picky. They want a little bit different style nowadays. And almost all the time now, really over the last couple years, I'm just installing square edge beams. So you don't have this reveal down here. And the difference is uh, now you have to miter this long length of beam. And if we back up a little bit here, you can see as I'm making these beams, they're 16 foot long. So the question is, how do you build beams like this on site nowadays in a way that's efficient, productive, precise, all those things? And the answer is with a track saw. So let's just imagine you're a finished carpenter going back 20 years. You're on the job site and you have a homeowner that requests beams like this with a, with a mitered edge and they're gonna be 16 foot long. How are you gonna build those things? Basically all you can do at that point is run them through the table saw. The issue with that is this material does not come straight at all. So if you're running it through the table saw, your miter is gonna follow the curve of the board. You're gonna get very imp imprecise results and it's gonna be very difficult to build that together. Here's an example right here I'm gonna show you. The first step that we do whenever we make beams is we need to straight line them. And this board in particular, I noticed, it's got a pretty good size crown in it. So if I go end to end, and if you can kind of show there is a solid probably five eighths of an inch crown in this board that if I want to straight line that, that chalk line is what I have to rip off. So nowadays, the fact that I have a track saw is an absolute game changer in my ability to make these mitered beams. So guys, long story short, we're blessed today to work with track saws. Right above me here, I've got a big, uh, super long beam all done with a track saw. If we look up here at this ridge beam, 17 inches tall, I had to glue up three different boards to get the depth I needed for that beam. All those cuts were made with a track saw. So I'm able to get glue line quality rips, perfectly straight miters, and it just makes uh, work so much easier. Let's get right into making these beams. I'll show you how it's done. For this project, uh, we're gonna be using a corded track saw. I do have the cordless here also. I've got, also got the Milwaukee cordless. I find when I'm doing a lot of ripping, which I'm doing a ton of ripping on this job, I prefer to hook the saw up to an actual cord and have the vacuum attached to it. Um, just works a lot better. As we're making these beams, the first thing we want to do is create a straight line. Now, what I've found works just really well is to use a chalk line. I like this chinois chalk line. It's got a point, a pin on the end, so I can stick it right on the end of the board. Then I'll just walk down to the other end, secure it, 
give it a little snap here. And what that's gonna give me is a reference line so that as I cut this, I know exactly where to position my track. Now, I've kind of dreamed about having a track that would be like 16 foot long, the full length. It's not really realistic. What I end up doing is I drop the track down on the line, I rip my miter halfway, I stop, move the track and position it down again. And if you're careful where you set the track down and line it up the second time, it really works well and you're able to still get that perfectly straight rip. I didn't mention it, but whenever we start making these beams, you always want to have the crown down. Um, so basically, that'll, the first thing I'll do is I'll sight down the beam. In this case, I was able to see that the crown goes this way. Then I can put my chalk line right on the, the tip on the end of the board and see what I need to rip off. The other reason this is important is because whenever this turns into a beam and I'm actually installing it on the ceiling, I don't want to have a hump in the middle of the beam because that's just gonna make it harder to get into position. I'd rather have the crown down so that I'm making contact at the bottom of the beam and at the top of the beam, and then I can scribe my line to the ceiling, bring it down, cut it, and put it back up. I think we're gonna make another video next week showing how to actually go about that process, so stay tuned for that. First things first, let's talk about our setup that we've got a little bit here. I've found it's a lot easier to make these rips if you have the workpiece nice and flat. Sometimes I'll do a board this long just with two sawhorses, but then it kind of wants to bend a lot. Here I've actually got four saw horses set up, as you'll see. And another trick that is really nice is to put a piece of scrap lumber down on top of the horses. That way, as you're ripping through, if you happen to go over the saw horse, you're not hitting the metal. You're just gonna go through these sacrificial boards. Works really well. Next thing, what angle should we be cutting these beams at? Uh, I recommend setting your saw to 46 degrees. I'm actually really glad I looked at this because I was kind of rushing through this whole process and realized I have it set at 45 right now. So I wanna move this to 46 degrees, as you'll see here, get it right on the money there, tighten it down front and back. Now the reason that that 46 degree number is important, and you guys have probably heard me talk about this before, is we want this outside edge, this very tip on the corner to come together nice and tight. If we're ripping and for some reason the there's an issue that keeps that corner from coming together um, perfectly. If you're ripping at only 45 degrees, it's not always gonna wanna come together and the glue will actually separate it sometimes. So going with 46 gives it a little bit more room to, to come together and just be nice and compressed on there. So let's get right into this. I've plopped my track down on my chalk line. I center my splinter guard right on the center of the chalk line. So that's kind of what our goal is. And it's always nice if you have a fairly fresh splinter guard because it is more accurate. I'm gonna pop my hearing protection in real quick. Safety first. So here's the kind of the crucial part that can be a little bit tricky. You want to make sure you get this aligned properly so that whenever I start my next miter and I'm joining to that miter that I just did, that we're perfectly in plane. So I'm going to be extra careful to make sure I'm lined up perfectly here on both ends so that this board is ripped perfectly straight. Looks pretty good. Plop it down on there again. Got 
Got my second board here. Gonna snap a line on that. Again, we've got the crown going down. Normally I like to batch cut all these pieces, uh, but since we're making the video, I'm kind of doing them two at a time. But normally I would just rip all of these 12 pieces at once and then just assemble all of my beams at once. So I'm flipping this around and I want to show you this is exactly what we want. Our, our whole strategy here is to create two rips that are perfectly straight and in plane. And that is gonna make it so much easier to miter fold the beam together and get great results. You'll see we're tight down here on the end and on the end down there as well. If we come to the center, I do have a slight gap, about a 16th of an inch, but that's still not even, maybe a 32nd. That's still very close. That's what we want to see. With these beams, they're a little bit of a unique size. Normally I'm installing beams that are like eight inches by eight inches square. This is more of a rafter style. So it's only three inches wide here in the center. Um, so what do we do to, to cut this narrow piece right here? The same principle is going to apply. We want to try to get a piece that's as straight as possible and accurately ripped at a 45 degree miter. The issue is if I want to get, I also need the width to be perfect the entire length. So what I do on this type of piece is I rip one edge with the track saw and that just gets me started really well so I know this is straight and it's accurate and then I rip the other side on the table saw. And the reason I do that is I want my width to be perfectly consistent the whole way. The problem is, let's say I rip one side with the track saw, and then I also try to rip the other side with the track saw. If the board has any kind of a curve in it after the grain tension is released, I'll end up having narrower portions and wider portions on, on the rip. So it's better on that, on this narrow center board to rip one side with the track saw, rip the other side with the table saw. You might be wondering, well, wait a second, is it critical to have the same dimension on the side pieces? And for me, the way I do this, the answer is no, because I'm going to put these in place temporarily and then I'm going to scribe them to the ceiling and then we'll cut them again. So this width on the side pieces does not have to be precise at all at this time because I'm going to be scribing them to fit to the ceiling. All right, now we're on to assembly. I'm going to go ahead and set my track aside. You'll see on these other beams that I've got sitting here right now, my tape just fell. Grab that. I've got tons of tape all across these. Maybe if we get a close up here, you'll see just a bunch of pieces of tape about every 13, 14 inches apart. And that is our, our assembly method that we're gonna use. Now I've talked a lot about miter folding in other videos. I've changed my technique a little bit from what I showed in previous videos. I'll show you what I'm doing a little bit different. We're ready to start our miter folding process. The thing about pine and using a rip this narrow is pretty much no matter what you do to it, 
when you rip it to that final dimension, that grain tension is released and it's still going to want to twist and bow and curve a little bit. Now straight line ripping it with a track saw makes it so much better, but there's still a little bit of inconsistency with that. So what I'm finding that I like to do is uh, take some pieces of tape and I just, I don't try to assemble the entire thing first. I'll just start getting this narrow rip in position in a, in a few spots as we work our way down here. So what we wanna be doing right now, if we can get close up right here, you look at these two very sharp corners. We want to get those so that they are perfectly even and in alignment. So I'm trying to kind of manipulate this and push it around so that wherever I put my tape, that corner comes together perfectly. And like I said, this piece is not perfectly straight, so we are manipulating it a little bit as we go to get it where we want it. But the reason that we're doing that is because then whenever we go from flat to folded, it's gonna make this corner come together perfectly. Something that you guys have probably seen me do in other videos that I've changed up a little bit that I'm not doing anymore is I used to run a piece of tape down the entire length of the miter like this. I really haven't been doing that as much. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. If I can get this to fold over here, we're not quite even on this end. Just to demonstrate. So it uses up a lot more tape. It takes a ton of tape when you're doing this many beams if you're going to run it all the way down the edge. It also prevents you from being able to burnish the corner and then sand it right away. I like to have access. If we come down here a little bit, whenever I've got tape every 16 inches, I have access to most of this miter to sand it out and get it nice and crispy right now. The other thing is I find that if you tape the miters like this, going the full length, sometimes the tape wants to pop off and I found that I still would have to run a piece of tape perpendicularly as well. So I've kind of just stopped doing that. I'm not running tape the entire length most of the time anymore. I've kind of tacked this center piece in place with just some smaller pieces of tape. And what that does is it kind of gets it started nice and straight with my first piece here. And now I'm just going through and I'm putting a longer piece of tape all the way across. So just like so, drop it on there, run it all the way through, and that's gonna be nice and strong so that uh, the tape doesn't wanna pop off or come apart whenever we actually fold it over. You will see, if you, if you look closely at what I'm doing here, this, these pieces do not want to go together perfectly. And that's because we're working with very imperfect materials here. Um, part of the, the skill involved here is to take imperfect materials and make them come out nice and crispy. Um, that, that's the challenge because this stuff is not perfectly flat. It's not straight whenever we start out. Another tip that I really wanna emphasize that's really important, you'll notice as I'm starting my tape, I'm folding it over on the end before I put it on here. And the reason for that is very simple. Whenever you get these beams done and you're going back through and you have to take all this tape off, trust me, you're gonna to wanna to be able to grab it and pull it off. Otherwise, on every piece, you end up trying to peel it loose with your fingernails and it's absolutely miserable. So as we go, I just take the tape, it's very sticky stuff, fold it over like that, and then put it on and that gives you a tab to pull it off later. Cut. We've got her taped up, it's time to flip it over. There's a little bit of technique involved whenever you're doing a beam this big. I pull it out like so, try and just kind of carefully fold it down and then lift from the center and we're flipped over and ready to glue. 
Time to glue up using tight bond one glue. Um, I switched to tight bond one years ago because I, as you could see, I wipe glue all over my pants, get it everywhere. Tight bond one will wash out of your clothes. That's the reason I use tight bond one. Get a glue bot by Fast Cap. It allows you to squeeze glue out in the upright position. Um, that's super handy, like whenever I was doing these beams and I had to assemble those miters, being able to put glue on like this is so nice versus where you would have a normal glue bottle and you're doing this number and trying to flip it over and all that, it just doesn't work. So GlueBot works great for all scenarios. The key here is to get just the right amount of glue on, but not too much. You'll see as I go down the line here, I uh, kind of do a little squiggly pattern. That helps it more evenly spread out after we get to the end here. And what I'm looking for is to be able to just take my finger and with fairly firm pressure, I want to push and get a nice even layer of glue over this entire miter. I don't want a bunch of excess glue on this miter because then it's going to squeeze out the front and I'm going to have more junk to clean up at the end. So real firm pressure. I've got all of that left. I'll just come over here to the trash can, wipe it in there. So when you're doing this, if, you, if you're running your finger over it and you notice that you've got a spot that feels a little bit too dry, don't feel, be afraid to put another bead on and spread it out again. We want that nice even layer to ensure that that miter stays together. We've got it glued up, it's time to fold it up. As you're folding this up, if you've got a board that's kind of crooked, you may notice that it doesn't quite want to feel like it's going. Um, in that case, sometimes you kind of have to stop and help it align itself. That one went up pretty well. This one feels like it's going up well also. Now when I install these, I'm going to have a cleat on the ceiling that is uh, just two by material, since this is approximately three inches wide. I ripped my bottom piece so that I would have about an inch and nine sixteenths or even an inch and five eighths of space on the inside here. So after I glue this up, we're just gonna drop a block in there. We're gonna take some tape and fold it over because you can see that this wants to separate and we wanna kinda lock it in place a little bit. So I'm just gonna drop a piece of tape over the block and try and just keep that spacing of about an inch and nine sixteenths or an inch and five eighths inside there. That way it'll slip right up over my blocking in the ceiling really well. I didn't want to make that super tight because then I would have to fight it as I'm installing it. If either my cleat or the beam wasn't perfectly straight, I want to have a little bit of forgiveness. So we'll do this basically on both ends and in the center. tape over that and we're, we're good to go then. Now we'll flip it over and we'll see how we did. What we want to see is kind of like this, just a very, very light amount of glue coming out. The miter is nice and tight. I mean, you can see that's almost perfect, doesn't need any attention at all. If we come over here on this side, You'll see I've got a little bit more glue squeeze out, a little bit more blobs. Um, it's just a little bit more of a mess to clean up. I try and get that excess glue wiped off right away before it starts to get tacky. It's easiest to clean it off right now. Um, but in this business, time is, is money. So it's these small details, like not over gluing it so that you have extra work sanding dried glue off that really makes all the difference in the world. We really want to just be able to fold this together 
and have the miter be basically almost perfect um, right after we fold it up. So material is always imperfect. I wanna show you a couple things here. So why are we using all this tape? Part of the reason is it's easy to assemble. The other reason is it doesn't create the need for a bunch of fasteners. The glue is, the, the tape is holding it in place until the glue dries, which means I don't have to put nails every 10 inches all the way up and down these beams. It'll end up with a better finished look and it's less labor for the painter to have to fill hundreds or thousands of nail holes. You will, however, at times still have boards that are a little bit wonky and don't want to go together perfectly. Here I've got a little bit of space. This I think was actually because of um, ripping it on the table saw. I'm guessing the piece came up a little bit. So I'm gonna pull that together with a nail. One other thing to note, whenever I first started making beams on this job, I tried to use my 23 gauge pin nailer um, on some of these miters. With this white pine spruce material, it's such a soft wood that the 23 gauge pin nails just weren't giving much holding power. So that's why I'm using 18 gauge brads here. It's a little bit larger hole, but I needed that larger nail for the holding power. So we wanna just now, uh, after I've kind of wiped off most of the glue, but I just wanna go along in any areas that look like they aren't being held together really well by the tape or they look like they're separating a little bit. I'll go ahead and just put a couple nails in just to help it out, make sure everything is staying nice and tight. But uh, most of the time it doesn't require too many nails. Here this end doesn't look like it's wanting to go together great. So I'll help it out. As you can see, if we get up close there, that's not coming together tight. So a couple nails from both directions gets me right where I wanna be. Now we want to burnish that outside corner. This is an extremely important step. You wanna do it at the right time. I've got most of the, any of that excess glue squeezed out. I, I wiped most of it off. You don't want to let your glue dry without doing this step because if your glue dries, this corner gets really hard and you can't compress the end. So we're gonna take something round, it could be a screwdriver, um, a chisel, whatever, and we're gonna just kind of burnish the end here. And what we're doing is we're compressing the grain on this outside corner so it's going to go together seamlessly. You can see as I go, just applying some nice pressure to that whole area. I'm trying to go pretty light as I go over the tape because the problem is if you go super hard over the tape and then you sand the tape, uh, it'll end up wanting to tear at the corner, which I showed earlier a little bit. So just kind of going light. This is a pretty quick process. It doesn't take very long at all. Just going all the way down the line here. And the reason we do it while the glue is still wet is now I can take my sandpaper and this, this has got a little bit of a gap right here. As you can see, this is not perfect. But as I sand this, it's gonna mix, the sawdust is gonna mix with that glue and it's gonna fill in and just create this perfect seam on the outside corner here. So I'm going over all the raw wood and I'm trying not to sand over the tape too much because it's gonna to wanna to make the tape break on that corner whenever I try to pull it off if I sand too aggressively over that tape. But this is a step that doesn't take very long, but it creates, this is what creates that perfect looking result, is getting that corner compressed and then lightly sanded just gonna look really good here. You can see that, just a nice crisp corner. Here I've got the first beam that I glued up today and I wanna just kinda show you the process on finishing this up. I've got my tape here and 
again, you'll see being able to grab that nub is really important. And there's kind of a technique that I use. I kind of rock it like so, so that it doesn't tear on that corner. You will notice sometimes as you're pulling this off, um, so like right here, it just tore on the corner because I just ripped at it and I had sanded this a little bit, which made the tape get thin on this corner. So that's where you have to then start digging at it a little bit. You will notice, um, I didn't mention previously in this video, but I've used a couple different types of tape. You can use like a standard heavy duty box tape, but um, it just doesn't work well. I've found I really like to use strapping tape. So strapping tape has those fibers that are going through the tape, makes it really strong. It also has some elasticity so that as you're folding your miter over, this type of tape will even stretch a little bit. I will link the tape in the video notes um, of the, this type that I'm using. Um, I'll also link the glue bot. I'll link this tape dispenser. This thing, this is what you want. It's super nice. But that stuff helps out the channel too if you use those links to purchase those items. I much appreciate it. So we'll keep pulling this off, kind of rock it as you work your way around. See that one tore off right there because I over sanded through that corner. So those are the small details that translate to a slow carpenter or a fast carpenter because a fast carpenter has his tape all pulled off and he's on to the next thing. The slow carpenter now has to go back with his little fingernails and try and dig this crap off of the corner to pull this tape off and it's a big pain. So. Small details are what translate into a big time savings in the end. All right guys, so hopefully this helps you out. I'm telling you that working with a track saw for mitered beams has been an absolute game changer for me. If you compare the workflow that was normal 20 years ago where we would have been on the job site with just a job site table saw and that's all we had access to, you really couldn't do this kind of work because the table saw has such limitations. With a track saw, you've got the ability to drop a track on, it'll stay completely flat to the table or to, the, to your workpiece, whereas with the table saw, you've always got that problem with your board lifting up on the table whenever you're doing 16 foot material like this. So we get excellent results. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Drop a comment. Let me know what you do different. Um, I'm always up for learning new techniques, but uh, stay tuned. I think we're gonna make a video showing the install process on these truss beams next week. So look for that one coming out as well. As always, thanks for watching. Check out the affiliate links for the tools that I used in this video below in the video description. And I always appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you on the next one.